listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 280. Today's podcast is brought to you by hititboard.com and the new Teeter Teach It, an easy to use tool that controls the amount of tip on your teeter so you can introduce motion to your dog in a gradual way. Go to hitaboard.com for the new Teeter Teach It and other agility training tools and toys. Use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today, we're doing the wrap-up podcast for the AKC National Agility Championship. So that's the American Kennel Club. And then we have two very special guests to help us do that. Our first guest is actually a regular, a co-host here on the podcast. Of course, it's Bad Dog Agility Instructor. Jennifer Crank, the 16-inch winner uh, at this year's Nationals. Jennifer, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Excited to be back again, this time almost more as a guest versus a, a co-host. No, don't worry. We're going to put you to work as a co-host. You're going to be the <laughs> guest and the host. And you will be hosting our second special guest, the judge who designed one of the, in my mind, legendary now AKC Nationals finals courses, Tim Varelli. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, guys. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself, your dogs, your personal history with uh, the sport of dog agility. Okay. Um, Well, I've been involved in the sport of dog agility since 1993, basically. uh, Wow. uh, My wife was involved with it with her Springer Spaniel, who just adored me. She was having problems getting through a jumpers course at the time. And I made the stupidest comment any man can ever make was, well, why don't you let me try? How hard could it be? <laughs> wow. You know, the story's familiar. I, I don't know where I've heard it before. Oh my I, goodness. I feel it in my bones. They announced it during the um, preferred part of the, um, the championship run runs. But uh, so I went out healed him around the course qualified and she handed him to me and says, okay, he's yours now. So that's where I started. Then I became a USDA judge in 95 and an AKC judge in 2006. I've judged in all the States in the United States, plus uh, several distinct countries, Costa Rica, Mexico, Canada, Bermuda, Spain, Australia. So I have a lot of background. That is amazing. Now, over the course of this long and storied career, would you say that you're judging more now or um, less now compared to earlier in your career? And and how much uh, how much trialing do you typically do? Trialing, I still do quite a bit. Uh, trialing, I do once or twice a month, even during these these current times. Uh, judging has slowed down a little bit just because. Um, things go in circles with judging. You get the flavor of the month judges, plus all the new judges come out and then they get a lot of things and then they go, Oh, let's go back to some of the older judges. But so I judge about once a month, typically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. And what kind of dogs are you running, uh, now? And have you run over, you know, these 20, 20 some odd years? Okay, currently I'm running um, three Scottish Terriers, and occasionally I, my wife allows me to run her Pumi and or her Moody. Um, before that, I had a giant Schnauzer. Before that, I had the Springer Spaniel. So I've competed in almost every height there is. Wow, that is super interesting, Moody. That's also very cool. Does your wife also judge? Yes, my wife also judges. That was one of the reasons we went to Australia was because they could do a two for one, bring two, bring a couple, they both judge. And that's how we got the Australia gig. Oh, that's awesome. That is very cool. All right. Well, let's talk. I I, I just want to like jump right into jump right into these uh, finals. How does the AKC figure out which judge does the finals. Can you, is that something that you're able to tell us here on the podcast? Is it drawing Um, straws out of a hat? Well, I can tell you that um, the majority of of this year's um, judging crew was actually supposed to be doing last year's Mm. this course or or the courses I designed for this year were actually the courses that I designed for last year, 
which I made some tweaks after, you know, last year's fell apart. And ironically, AKC came out and asked, you know, when everything was was going offline, they were saying, hey, can we just put out your courses so they could do virtual at home? And everybody was hemming and hawing about it. And I basically said, no, I don't want my course out because <laughs> I want to see it run. I spent a mm. lot of time on this course and I wanted to see it run and not just have everybody do it at home because it just wouldn't be the same. Um, I do know that there was some political moving around, but uh, I think I got the nod because I have the international experience. I had just judged earlier the uh, EO team tryouts, and so they wanted something a little a little different when it came to the finals this year, or that year, and now this year. Yeah, there are a lot of things I really liked about the finals, and I think at this point, I want to turn it over to Jennifer a little bit. I want to hear your thoughts on the uh, final course, uh, especially the course design, the issues that it presented to you as a competitor, and then have you and, and Tim kind of walk through, you know, the, the the what I guess what I would call the key points in the course. So I thought in general, the courses this year were more difficult than I was expecting. Um, I felt mm. very guilty for under-preparing my students um, for the quantity of basically the quantity of backsides and threadles. Um, and, and they were very traditional backsides in the sense that a lot of two seventies, um, but. Oh, you mean at, in the preliminary round? I'm just well. talking courses yes. in general, gotcha, yes, just gotcha. for the courses uh -huh. in general. Um, I thought that they were harder than, than years past, which personally I was okay with, but like I said, I felt, I felt, uh, I, I felt like I underprepared my students for them. Um, looking at challengers round in challengers round with Swift, I had to do two threadles and a backside which I thought was a lot for what we are traditionally used to in AKC. So by the time we got to finals, I was, I was ready for anything, right? We had gotten through right. all these other courses that were much harder than I was prepared for. Um, obviously I'm a fan of the finals course. I ran two dogs on it. Both of them were clean and pink ending up winning, but um, I thought there was very good uh, consistency of the courses in all of the rounds, like the pre preliminary rounds, the premier course. I really liked the premier course on uh, Friday. I thought it presented appropriate challenges without being like too much. Um, and I do know that there's a lot of talk of like, you know, in, uh, invitational courses will be different than nationals courses. And I, and I thought they were, um, I just think I under, under prepared, um, in that regard. Although I did set up one of Tim's, your EO, speaking of e judging EO, one of your EO courses to try to prep for nationals. Um, and then, so for the finals course, I thought, I, I think of there being a lot of things that happen on finals courses, whether or not the judges intend to or not, but I like courses that you're going to see handler variety. Like I don't want to go to finals mm -hmm. and watch 75 mm -hmm. people run the exact same plan. Like I want to see right. changes in plan. I want to see a little strategy. So not just execution, but strategy as well. Um, and it included that. I think, you know, good um, crowd appeal is when you have something maybe a little technical at the end, right? Everybody's sitting on the edge of their seats right up until the very end, you know, um, so things that don't require super long lead outs, nobody wants to sit there and watch 75 people do a three jump lead out. So like all of those elements that mm, I think of as making up really good, um, finals courses were there. And what I liked uh, about this particular finals course is, uh, it really did test the handling as opposed to a course. And I would say this in any round, but especially finals, a course that comes down to, well, can the dog keep the bars up and make the contacts? Like, mm. I don't like courses that it's just down to that. I like courses that are going to be a combination of trained skill, like contacts, we pull entries and jumping, but also handling. And I thought this course did that, right? You had crosses after the A-frame, which tests A-frame. You had that we pull entry, discrimination off the dog walk, those all testing skills but also handling a lot of choices coming out of that tiny tunnel on the end, what people wanted to do there, the section right there on five, six, seven. So I thought it was kind of the perfect blend of skill and handling. And th those are kind of some of the things that I looked at and why I liked that course so much. Yeah. I really like that skill element that you mentioned there, because I think it's definitely possible where you get courses uh, you know, everybody runs it the same way. And then it's kind of the fastest dog wins, right? Who happens to have the dog with the most speed and it kind of removes that handler element. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really like that. Um, so Tim, you, you've now heard from the, the champ, the now two-time champ, right? With pink. 
That's right. So now you've won the National Agility Championship twice on top of the, uh, I think, three Westminster wins. Yes, it's that is correct. It's hard for me to keep track. You're winning all the time. Okay. <laughs> and, and so she's kind of uh, gone through the course here. And so were these some things that you had in mind when you were putting this course together? Okay. Well, first off, I do have to say, when they asked me to design it, the first thing they said to me was, don't give them a boring finish. Don't just do like, you know, dog walk, finish it off. So the first thing I designed on this course was actually that ending. I really wanted to see what choices people would make and would they do the right things for their, for their dogs. And you, you saw mm. that in, in the running, you know, as dogs took 17, you know, it was fine, whichever way you went, if you handled it, 17 was the jump after the, the straight tunnel, but then you mm. could sit and just in your mind count as you saw dogs go really wide and you're like, okay, yeah. you may have fast ground speed, but you just wasted two seconds on your 17 turn. And then you're really wide on 18 to 19 and you added two more seconds. So somebody who's efficient can pick up four seconds on you. Mm-hmm. And that's what I really wanted with this course with that challenge set there. And also the whole five, six, seven was how are you going to handle it? What path are you going to pick? And is it going to work for your dog? Right, right. I love the options. Yeah, Because absolutely. that's where you generate that variety in handling. Mm-hmm. Even when you do something as basic as, um, what are they called? The bi-directional jumps or tunnels, where you can choose one way or the other, right? And I think they did have some of that in the preliminary rounds. I think there was a bi-directional jump. Yeah, in the challengers, I think there was a bi-directional jump. They had it was a actually a hybrid. In the hybrid. Yeah, oh, okay. jump number two of hybrid. Was was interesting, and and that's one thing that we've tried pushing more is you know bidirectional jump shouldn't just be about oh well I don't have to judge a refusal there there should be some sort of an advantage by going one way or the other if you mm-hmm. take it straight well then you have to deal with whatever comes after if you push for the backside the harder before then it should be easier after so the same thing here is you know I, I found it very interesting some of the dogs. Um, Andrea, for instance, um, with her Papillon, when she went five, you know, she specifically asked me, I'm going to have a problem if I turn them in and go towards the dog walk and then push for another backside. I go, you're not on the approach to six. Doesn't matter what you do. Go for it. So it was just interesting to see the different handling styles for that entire sequence, that five, six, seven. Yeah. And did you anticipate as uh, the So it's a challenge in and of itself without the draw of the dog walk, but the draw of the dog walk adds another layer onto that. And we saw a lot of dogs at least head for that dog walk. I'm not sure that any actually took it, but they would head for that dog walk. Oh, several dogs took it. (laughs) Okay. Okay. A couple of dogs. Right. So was, uh, was that um, in your mind as the course designer or was that like, that you know, was like, just a, an added bonus. I didn't really expect it to be that much of an issue. Right. But it was an added bonus. So my yeah. question on number five is, uh, did you go out of your way to make that a five-foot bar? Or was that just the bars that they used and that therefore was it was the, a five-foot bar? That was just the bars they had. They were all Because I, that was what got me, is I trained on four-foot bars and it was <laughs> Smith. I didn't get, I didn't get, I didn't get out of the way. Like I... And running through and thinking, why did I have so much difficulty at the point I needed to step up where I thought I'd be for the blind? The wing was there. So I had to take an extra step to my right. Mm -hmm. And then I missed the blind. And I, uh, you know, that's that's on me, right? Training on shorter bars because the shorter bars are harder for the dog. So that's what I do. But the bigger bars being harder for the handler. So, you know, um, my friend Abby telling me, she's like, if that would have been a shorter bar, you would have been fine. But we didn't do enough training on those big jumps. And it was just in your way. So I wasn't sure if they just told you, hey, we're using five foot bars or if you went out of your way to make that one a, a big jump. Now, to be honest, I didn't even check to see what length bars. I'm just so used to everybody using five foot bars now that I just assumed it was going to be a five foot bar. Well, it was a nice added challenge, I will say. Yeah, that is super interesting because we typically had, uh, I think, five foot bars for years. And then when we realized that they were still using four foot bars in some places, we actually had to go back and train with four foot bars to help our dogs out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then I was like, ooh, it is easier to get around on some of these backside SERP type um, maneuvers. 
Uh, what we're going to do for everyone who's listening, because sometimes it's, it's, if you haven't seen the course map, right, it's kind of hard to know what we're talking about. So what we're going to do is in the show notes, there's going to put up the course map, the original course map. And I had done like a, uh, like a preview uh, analysis of the course map. We'll go ahead and throw that up there. We did that for our VIP members, but we'll just make that publicly available. So you guys can see some of the things that um, we're talking about. And, and that was before any dogs ran too. That was you right, looking right. at the course before any Without dogs knowing. Yeah. running. So, so this is where I think, uh, Tim, you get a lot of credit because when I'm looking at a course, I typically feel like I've got all the answers at whatever level it is, right? Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at courses, breaking them down, running them, training and all that stuff, right? But I got there to that end spot and I was like, you know, I don't really know the best way to take the dog here. Now, obviously the way the way the map is, the way the course set up a little bit different, but my conclusion at the end of my analysis was there, you know, I, I got to get out there and, and walk this course to really think about uh, which line is going to be the best to close out. Again, getting getting those options. And we saw so many, there was, there was a big division amongst the handlers, right? Some turned the dog right over that jump. Others turned the dog left. It wasn't like everybody went one way and then like one or two random people went the other. Like there's a pretty good split um, between the two, but it's, if that's going to make people like me think, I think that's really, that's really a good course design. And the other thing that's kind of related to that is you had two, the, the two fastest times, right? The 20 inch winner, right? Which uh, just got you and hallelujah, right? Mm -hmm. And Jennifer here with pink in the 16 inch class, they both ran clean and won, but they both ran other dogs, right? In the finals uh, that did not get through the course clean, right? You got them, right? Some of these things, you got them. Swift was clean, just not. Well, okay. Yeah. There was was a. Okay. That's that's fair. That's fair. fair. That Jessica actually ran three dogs in that 20 inch. Division. That's right. right. That's right. She ran Bailey and Bailey didn't make the televised, uh, the, uh, no. final. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the televised, uh, broadcast in, in a bit, but, but she yeah. also ran Optimus. And I actually was, was yes. curious when they, when they did it, I looked to see, and she was actually a second faster with hallelujah coming out of the straight tunnel than Optimus when she had the problem with the, mm. with the refusal that she got at the next jump. Mm. So, Hallelujah still would have won even if Optimus had been clean. It right. looked like at that yeah. point because she had a good second. But that also comes from the third time running, and she's like, you know, partly gassed, partly winded. But- right, right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but my point is that um, yes, these two handlers, you know, they crushed it, but also before they crushed it, they didn't crush it. You know, <laughs> such was the uh the the level of the the course you know just having those really interesting elements where um i'm not saying anybody was confounded but i'm just saying it it was not an easy course to get through and i think it made for really uh great viewing sorry yeah well yeah i think the other thing I, i was thinking about this today about you know what i liked about this course i mean there there are like five different parts of this course that we could talk about but one of the other great aspects was the big long uh, sections that let the dog really show their speed and also challenge the handler. Another interesting spot on the course that I really liked was after they do the A-frame, they have the, the number nine jump, and then they have to turn sharply to the triple. And Jessica and Jennifer were all over that turn, right? Working really hard to control that turn. But we saw a, a, what felt like a million dogs uh, take the, the back jump number 19 off course, right? They, where they turn you know, the handler's calling them or they're, they're rear crossing or, or whatever the handler's doing, but they end up taking that extra jump. Did you know, it was this like a dog walk situation? Did you know that was going to be a, a huge trap there or yes, not I, so much? That one, I knew that was going to be a problem because I just had a feeling that if people weren't handling that well enough and not anticipating mm-hmm. and telling the dog, Hey, you're taking this jump and we're immediately turning, you're going to go wide. And they were going to get some really weird things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So do you sit there? I imagine as a judge. Okay, I know as an instructor that sometimes when I'm putting together things, I'm like, <laughs> like rubbing my hands together in glee, thinking about what I'm doing. Do, do you do that just a little bit? Just a little bit? Not when I'm designing, because I'm not trying to be devious. <laughs> but when you see something that actually comes out and you go, yeah, that's good. I mean, I've always had a philosophy with agility, with other things is that, you know, you're out there, you and your, your dog. And I I think of your dog as a sports car. You buy yourself a sports car. You better know how to drive it. So Mm -hmm. 
You're going to get some of these spots. You better know how to give them directions and tell them what they're going to do before they take off so they know what they're doing once they land. And that's yeah. why I loved you know that sequence specifically on this course. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the very cool things is you've got people setting up this course. There were people that set it up the same day and we're posting on Facebook. We set it up. Had, we set up the ending the same day. Yeah, right. We 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 set up we set up the ending just cuz I I really wanted to see like which way it was uh going to be um uh faster. And I think well, I mean, we'll have a post about that some other time. Uh taking a closer look at that. Okay, one more thing about the finals course and here I'm going to throw it to Jen because I, this whole time I thought I had learned this from Sarah, but it turned out Sarah learned it from Jen, so I just <laughs> want to go to the original source. People may or may not notice that the number 16 tunnel is not a full, big old, regular 20 foot straight tunnel. It's actually a little bit short. Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, when they first removed the chute several years ago, you know, we, we saw the removal of the chute and then it was just gone and it disappeared. But around the same time, we started to see on a lot of other courses, international courses, other organizations, these short 10 foot tunnels. Um, and I said, I bet what's going to start to happen is people, judges are going to take the short straight tunnel and replace it with the shoot. And if I'm correct, and Tim would know better than this, I think, you know, some of the organizations even encouraged it and said, you know, where you would normally put the shoot, throw in this straight tunnel. So where AKC would previously say two tunnel passes, they actually allow three tunnel passes now if one of them is a short straight tunnel. It doesn't have to be straight, but it can't be bent um, past a certain degree. It has to be like a 45 degree turn or less. I don't know. It's a very soft bend, but this tiny tunnel, the short tunnel that almost is there to replace what was previously the chute. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I would never have put a chute there because then I would have been stuck um, straightening it. But yeah, um, <laughs> Jenna's right. I mean, the biggest reason that we add or use the, the, the 10 foot tunnel now is because it's the one tunnel that we can have where it actually can be straight. AKC is pretty stringent that you have to see both the entry and the exit on tunnels. That's why you won't see a straight 20 foot tunnel oh. normally on course because you have to see the inner entry and the exit. So you'll see these with slight bends with the exception of the 10 foot tunnel. They let us do that. Um, one other thing I always find interesting with, with straight tunnels or with tunnels in them is handlers don't think about the fact of what the dog actually sees in the tunnel. Because when right. the dog is coming out of a tunnel or going in, I mean, as soon as the dog goes straight into that tunnel, they see 17. They know where they're going. Mm -hmm. But the handlers don't think about what the dog sees until they see the dog. And it's like, okay, but the dog's been keyed on this next jump since before it went in, after it cleared, you know, the jump back, which was, you know, the 5-15 combination. So... Yeah. And that was a new addition. I, I just looked it up in the judges blog. Um, and that was like October, 2019 that they began allowing that. And that that's what I remember, Jennifer. I remember listening to one of her like instructional videos and she was like, this is now allowed. And I think you're going to start seeing it in local trials. And then here we are at, at the finals and there's that uh, short tunnel. So kudos to Jennifer for recognizing, um, you know, the trend on the horizon and then uh, being prepared for it here. I yeah. love the short straight tunnels. It's fun. They're fun. Yeah. We train them a lot. And I, you know, I like the safety of them. They're light, they're visible dogs don't aren't slipping and wiping out as much. So I'm a fan. Uh, Tim, I think you just made some uh, equipment companies, uh, some, some dollars. I, <laughs> I turned to Sarah. I was like, uh, we need to get this 10 foot tunnel. Like I, we're not just going to shorten up one of our longer tunnels. Like I want a legit 10 foot tunnel in our well, yard. You because you also want to think, and, and this is something else you don't think of. If you take any of the longer tunnels and you try squishing them down, you're really making it harder on the small dogs because you're compressing all that wire inside. And now they're right. running instead of being able to run on basically the, the fabric of the, of the tunnel, they're mm -hmm. having to hit those wire ribs the entire way through. All right. That's a really great point because I was like, okay, we can just shorten our tunnel and we no, have no. big dogs, like, but what you're if they absolutely their toes right. Yeah. Or, you know, for like, the small dog, it's a must to yeah. have that shorter tunnel. Yeah. Maybe even for the larger dog. Yeah. Yep. I think you definitely need to get the, uh, the short tunnel in there. Um, all right. So Tim, let me kind of zoom out a little bit, get a little more general, uh, with you for a second. What do you think? Well, okay. Let me start with, uh, AKC nationals because it's such a big event. 
a uh, little bit Westminster as well. I think of them as kind of top-down events where the things you see there, people say, and the things that people struggle with, people say, okay, over this next year, I'm going to work on these things, right? So Jennifer feels she underprepared her students. I guarantee you next year, they're going to be overprepared, right? So they're going to be attacking these elements. They're going to seek out trials and judges who are putting up elements like this or similar to this. So it can be very impactful on kind of where agility goes over the, over the next year. So when you look at the longer arc of say, you know, maybe the last uh, year or two, and I do understand that, you know, the pandemic and, and fewer trials and all that's changed a little bit. Uh, and then looking into the future, you bring out your crystal ball a year or two, like what kind of general trends do you think you're seeing specifically in the American Kennel Club? Um, I, I th- <sighs> that's a tough question. Uh, I think that you'll start seeing more technical courses that aren't as as vanilla cookie cutter. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody loves those, but they're kind of boring after a while. You, you, we've all run the same courses over and over and over again. And the one thing I've heard from everybody that went to nationals was they really enjoyed that they had to step up their game. And I think that's what we're going to start seeing, especially with the trend in push more. Everybody's going for the agility grand champion and you need the premier legs and that that you start going to see some of these more somewhat technical, but also, you know, just let's see what you and your dog can do. The sport has evolved. Let's evolve as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I think as a group, agility competitors like to be challenged. Right. Yep. They like to uh, step up. It's why we're in the sport. We find interesting things, uh, you know, uh, and no disrespect to obedience, but like old school obedience was kind of the same routine. Right. And you did it a couple of times and then you would get a title. But agility, like that's what was so cool about it uh, way back when, you know, like every course is different and people are like, oh, you know, it's always different. It's always something new. Um, but you make the very good point. Like everyone here on this podcast, right, has been around this, the sport like basically 20 years plus. Right. So you've kind of been around the block. You've seen just about everything. And so for me to look at this course map and I remember getting the course, map. I woke up and they're like, is the course map been posted? And then when it was, I was like, whoa, I'm really excited about this course map. Definitely got to watch the finals. I'm, I'm glad Jennifer made it. So it was an exciting thing. I think like an infusion of enthusiasm when people are challenged. And so, you know, agility, I, I feel like it needs to constantly evolve to meet the demands, meet the challenges that people want Right. And I I feel like maybe we're um, we're transitioning a little bit because uh, with the like it's been a while since Premiere was introduced. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when it first came out, it was kind of like this extra class, you know, uh, uh, some number of people were doing it, but not in general, all the master's dogs. Right. And um, and now I feel like we're transitioning into it being more seen as a regular part of agility. And, and you have new dogs coming up that are um, now being prepared for that from the very beginning and how like the puppies are trained for, for instance. Right. And so I think that we're going to see a transition from the, Oh, that's kind of the new thing. You know, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I won't to, to people just expecting that they're going to compete, you know, on those courses and at that level. I mean, when we think about just nationals before there was premier and ISC, there was the state championship, right? Who remembers that? Right. I remember it, but it seems like a really long time ago that we did the state championship. So that just kind of gives you an idea of how long this has been around, how long, you know, Premier has been a part of the national championships, for instance. Yeah, I think they said 24th. Yeah. Championship. And I agree because we're, we're seeing a shift in that not only is premier now part of the grand championship, as Tim mentioned, but, you know, we saw the rule change. It used to be you had to be in masters to do premier and AKC said, OK, no, any dog, you know, so they're allowing dogs to start it younger. Um, and then I was going to comment about nationals, you know, it's the state team tournament. Then, if you recall, went to time to beat. Right. So Friday oh, yeah. warm up used to be time to beat. Oh, and yeah. then they said, you know what, let's throw Premier in. So mm-hmm. we are seeing a shift um, from AKC and, and from the I think the, the demands and comments of the exhibitors as well to make Premier more regular. Right. It's not this specialty class, but now mm-hmm. you can say, oh, I'm going to the trial and I'm going to enter four classes or I'm going to enter five. 
where it used to be like, I'm going to do standard and jumpers and maybe a gain. So I a hundred percent agree that we're seeing that shift. And just in, as I mentioned, the courses this year, having a stronger uh, tendency, even in the preliminary rounds of the backsides and then the challengers having the backsides and the threadle. So I agree a hundred percent that we're going to see less vanilla. I use that term a lot. So I liked that, Tim, when you mentioned that less vanilla cookie cutter courses and a little bit more mm-hmm. variety, make, make handlers have the skills and make them think a little bit in strategy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and I'll say just in on vanilla's behalf that I enjoy vanilla. It's my favorite flavor of ice cream, but I understand your point very, very well. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about the broadcast because I happen to know both Jennifer and Tim have watched it. I'm guessing because they wanted to see what they look like on TV. So, which is fabulous, which is fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. So uh, Tim, let, let me, let me start there. You know, you're going to be on a uh, TV and uh, did that affect your wardrobe and, and shoe selection? Were you conscious of that? Well, no, we were told what we had to wear. So oh, I knew okay. that I had to wear khaki pants. I knew that I had to wear a blue blazer with a shirt and a tie. And I haven't worn a tie in, you know, eight years. So, <laughs> it was, uh, so I had to find ties that fit. Um, I was just glad in looking at, at the, um, at the broadcast. And I had some people say, well, I didn't really notice you. And I go, then I did my job. Nice. You nice. didn't see me as a judge, unless you just noticed that I was walking in the background, then I wasn't in the way <laughs> I did my job. And that's all that matters. Right. Right. Oh, I had a quick question. I was wondering where did they position the second judge who was spotting the dog walk? Were they in the ring or were they, they were just outside, outside the, the ring? ring? Because outside, okay. when um, I was wondering about that, was it Marco? And yes, Marco, Marco ran, ran the other side. Ran the other side. And he had said to, he actually said to Carrie DeYoung, the director, I think he said that he was going planning on going that. So we positioned the other judge actually oh. outside the ring so that there were no obstructions for anybody that decided to go. Right. That way. Interesting. I mean, that was an interesting spot too. I, 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 I would like to talk with Marco about it. When they went to the outside, I was like, whoa, I was a surprise. <laughs> and it's hard to surprise me. It's hard to surprise me. Um, okay, very cool. Very cool. And then, um, so let's talk a little bit about the broadcast. Everybody had a chance uh, to watch it. What were some of the things that we liked about the broadcast? Let me start with uh, Go, well, uh, well, before we get to that, let's just highlight the fact that this was on TV, TV. We're not talking about a live stream, oh, although yeah, they did me, have uh, that, sure. right? Let's, this was on ESPN, right? right? ESPN2. ESPN2. The, the two. Deuce. Yes, yes, Deuce. exactly. Not the Ocho, the Deuce. That's right, as it's affectionately known among sports fans who and spend this a lot is, of time on ESPN. Right, and this is a trend that, that we're seeing. So, you know, Quick, quick well, history lesson on broadcasting agility, right? It right, used right. to be like a decade ago, right? They used to um, put the national championship on Animal Planet. That's where we were introduced to agility. Esteban and, and I, more than like decade, 20, 20 yeah. years ago, right? It was oh. on Animal Planet. Then it wasn't on TV for years and years and years. And Westminster really brought that back. Um, but they were on Fox Sports 1. They put the invitational on Animal Planet as well yeah. for, for a year or two. Or, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah nationals and the, the invitational. Then, then uh, you know, really, it was it was a big deal to have it on uh, Fox Sports 1 with Westminster. Um, and it's been on Fox Sports 1 for several years. And now... Now, um, just and they were drawing between 800,000 and over a million. Yeah. Viewers. I mean, it was, you were getting a lot of viewers and these, obviously these, the majority of these viewers are not agility competitors. So we're having more people introduced to the sport and we think that's a great thing. Right. Um, but this year it switched or there, there was a new agreement between AKC and ESPN. And so now ESPN is going to, for the next several years, hold um, these events and they're showing um, nationals. I believe they're going to be showing the premier cup. Um, and the so, invitational. The, yeah, so they have this agreement. And so this was kind of the debut or the re-debut of the national agility championship on network TV. Right. Right. It's a big deal. I think it was for five years. And what we'll do is we'll link to that article yeah. describing the uh, deal, the contract between ESPN and the American Kennel Club. And so th- what they do is they have a live stream, right? So um, you could watch the challengers round on the live stream. You could watch the preferred finals on the live stream and also see the regular finals on the live stream, but it is only the regular finals that was broadcast on television, correct? right? On ESPN 
too. So you watch it on Sunday live on the live stream. And then they did a lot of editing, which was a good thing because the live stream was really rough for the yeah, final. Right? right. And then watch it on, I guess it was Wednesday. So like two nights ago, mm-hmm. right. On ESPN two two hour broadcast loaded with commercials, of course. Um, but yeah, let's talk about what we like. So I like that they had it certainly. Yeah. Right. I like that, this on cable TV. Yeah. That a lot of people could get access to it. Um, let me start with Jennifer then Jennifer, what, what were your thoughts on the, the broadcast, the good, the bad? A lot of the similarities I noticed um, on this broadcast from Westminster, which is as an agility person, everything is just a little bit too zoomed in, right? It's a little Mm. bit too close and it's very hard to get an overall picture of what's happening. Um, I heard an exhibitor say that they were watching the preferred from in their car and they had no idea what the course is. They were a finalist until they got down there and walked it. Now, I think what that does to the average person watching is it makes it super exhilarating super exciting. The dogs are going fast. You have those camera angles in the tunnel. So I think as an exhibitor, we kind of have to step back. I saw a lot of complaining and, and, and look at it from both perspectives. So while personally, I would have preferred a more panned out view, it's not all about me, right? I mean, they're not putting it on ESPN2 as much for the exhibitors as for everyone else. And they want to make it fun and exciting. They want to show a a diverse group of dogs, a diverse group of handlers, heights, breeds, sizes, speeds, all that. Um, So personally, I would have loved them to zoom out a little bit and have a better idea, um, you know, of what the the course was. Um, But I think they do a good job of like on the height breaks, talking about the history of the sport or highlighting some of the dogs. Um, Those those special uh, stories, I think, are a nice added bonus that they add in. Uh, I know at the beginning, they did like the kind of 3D CRCD where they take (laughs) you through the course, which is kind of, uh, kind of cool. So I think there's a lot of great things about it. Um, I, unfortunately, I know they have to cut some dogs out. So they didn't show every dog. That's always kind of a bummer for those people that were cut. And I do feel bad for them. Um, But I thought it was very similar having the experience of Westminster. I thought it was very similar. So for me, having a little experience, um, I thought it was, it was, you know, a match. We had Terry announcing Mm -hmm. the same, you know, but for somebody that was new and different, um, I could see where there would be some, you know, things that they might recommend changes on. Right, right. Tim, what do you think about the camera angles? Because those tight shots pretty much, they it really destroys your airtime. You know, if they're going to be focusing yeah. that tightly on the dogs and the obstacle, how are we ever going to see the judge? Well, I understand that. But I mean, what the, the home viewer wants to see is the dog. I know that the competitors want to see what the handler is doing, but the home competitors don't, I mean, the home viewers don't care about that. They want to see the dog. So I completely understand why everything is tight on the dog. Um, one of the things I think is funny is that, you know, when we're, we're taping it, we know they're going to edit it. So why are we taking these big, long pauses for commercial breaks when they're just going to edit and insert it in any way? Right. I don't understand it. Cause. Oh, right. My, right. My gripe right during is, the event, it, during the event, you know, that's why it did take two hours to run, you know, the finals when it was, you know, 90 dogs <laughs> or right. done a lot faster. It would have been nice because, first of all, for the competitor's sake, you're trying to get ready to go, but you're like, you never really know when you're going to go in. And that's got to be really tough on, on not as experienced handlers like like Jen. She's used to it. You know, she can go at it a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. But also as a judge, you get into a rhythm and you want to keep going. So you don't want to go, oh, let me slow down. Oh, yeah, this is a next. This is a really fast dog. I got to be on. You know, I want to just keep judging. Right. What I think would be really cool if ESPN would ever do it was if you ever watch, if you watch the four legged flicks, they had a very good view mm-hmm. and their videos were pretty good. It'd be great to have a the broadcast what they were doing, but then do a picture in picture, which either showed you an overhead view, mm-hmm. which you could easily do. You could mount a camera up in the rafters and then you Ooh, can just picture in picture. Down, that's really good. And you could see where they were on the corpse the entire time and get that perspective or even use just the four legged flicks as a picture in picture. That would be what I would personally would love to see change in the future. But, you know, nobody asks me for my opinion. Yeah. So, that's Well, that, I mean, that's a really good um, compromise. 
The other thing that I was thinking you could do was basically have a little wider out in some spots. And, you know, it's really the switching because when you mm-hmm. switch from angle to angle, your mind has to reorient the course. And when you're switching just for a few seconds and then you're switching again, you, your mind just never grasps it. Right. And so you can, you can switch like once or twice on, on a, on a big broad view. But what I was thinking they could do is, you know, zoom out a little bit as your, is your basic shot. And then have your tight tunnel replay the slow-mo, right? That's where you really get in on the dog. Uh, They typically do it with like the contacts. Did they get the contact? Like they show the weaving. Right after the dog finishes running, they always had like a replay shot. And so using those shots. That's a great time to do tight where you don't need to see the handling. You can be very focused in on the dog or the dog jumping into the handler's arms or the dog's weaving, you know, changing it up for each dog. Like maybe you do a rotation. We're going to do weave, tunnel, dog walk down jumping into the arms and then repeating that cycle, you know, for, for each dog, I think something like that would be really good. Well, the other thing that I I wanted to point out, so, so actually I'm sure that Jennifer and Tim didn't watch the live broadcast, right? They were, they were, (laughs) Tim definitely didn't watch it. Right. Cause he was in the ring. Jen, maybe you caught a little bit, um, but you know, mostly you're getting ready. We watched the entire live broadcast. And then we also watched the entire one that was on ESPN and let me tell the edited version, the edited version. And let me tell anybody who um, was so excited about nationals that they were watching the live stream. The edited version was significantly better because when you think about it, you know, when I was thinking about it later, when they're doing it live, when they would cut the from um, camera view to camera view, there has to be somebody saying, okay, cut to camera two, okay, cut to camera three, right? And they weren't always right right on, right? Sometimes you would see like an empty tunnel for a few seconds and then they would go, ah, you know, which camera is it? You know, and there were many, many moments like that. But in the edited version, all of that went away because you can, you can go back to the original footage and you can switch right where you want to. And so um, it really was much better. And I think some of the views were a little bit more zoomed. They used, because I'm sure they had footage from like every angle. And so they replaced some of the most egregious spots with better views. And I, and I thought the final broadcast was a lot easier to follow than the live was. Right. Right. And uh, next on the broadcast, I do want to talk about the uh, the people who were involved like doing the commentary. So as Jennifer pointed out, Terry Simons uh, is back. So he was doing he has been doing the Westminster uh, broadcast and that's for Fox. And so now he's doing this for ESPN, which is a different network, which I, I think is pretty interesting. Usually each network kind of has their own uh, commenters and they don't you know work for other networks. Um, so, uh, Terry provided the, uh, you know, the agility side, the agility expertise side, and then he worked alongside Carolyn Mano, M-A-N-N-O. Hopefully I said her name, uh, uh, correctly. And the reporter who's doing the interviews of the handlers after they run, you know, when they're all breathing really hard and, and Jennifer was so good. Jennifer, in fact, we'll just I can see her smiling from here here to moment. Ear. It was, uh, Tony Collins, who who did it, and they're both masked up. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about the interview, the, like what she asked and, and how hard you're breathing and what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I will never forget my first interview post Westminster. And it was the first time, you know, you'd come across the finish line, the interview, and I watched it back and I was like talking fast, breathing heavy. It was so awkward. And I, to this day, I'm embarrassed. So right away as I crossed the finish line, like without any hesitation, Harry's Carrie was like, go do your victory lap. I was like, oh my gosh, I just got done running. So I go to my victory lap oh. and I walk <laughs> right back. So now I've run the run and done the victory lap. And they're like, all right, interview time. And I just like stopped and did like yoga breathing. I was like, I'm just gonna deep breath, deep breaths, deep breaths, deep breaths, because I knew I would be like panting so heavy in the interview. Mm-hmm. Um, so I worked really hard on not sounding like a really heavy breather through my mask right. and after my <laughs> run. Um, it was, it was, yeah, it was definitely a moment I put some conscious effort into, but as far as the questions go, they were very generic. Um, yeah, I yeah, felt like yeah. they were almost all the same questions to every exhibitor. Um, you know, I've had situations where they interview you and it was very run specific, like, oh, we saw, you know, you really got that tight turn on number, you know, 17. Tell us a bit about that, which I like. It's a little more personal. It wasn't tell us about your relationship. Great run out there. You know, what are your thoughts? So um, I thought they were really generic, but 
as you already mentioned, it is the kind of first event of right. many that they're going right. to be doing. I have no doubt in my mind, they're going to learn, they're going to improve, they're going to make things better. Um, and I think the fact that they even did interviews is awesome. You know, they didn't have to, they could right. have right. easily just said, here's your winner, um, have the camera up and move on. So while I think it could use some tweaking, it was a good first effort. I'd like to see them make some changes as they go with regard to the questions, have each winner tell, you know, something specific about their run or their team, um, you know, versus just that generic, how does it feel type of question. Right. 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 And the, and the person doing it is actually, she's been like a sports center anchor, right? So uh, Tony Collins, and she's very, very good. And um, I definitely want to see them do a little bit more prep, right? Obviously, they're going to be uh, new to the sport, but you're right. The more they do it. So let's say they bring uh, Tony on for the next several years, right? She's going to be learning each year and getting better and hopefully studying the sport a little bit because that's what we saw with Jen Hale, right? The, Jennifer Hale, who did the commentary for um, Fox, West, West oh, I'm sorry, Westminster, yes. Westminster and uh, uh, Fox Sports, right? She she interviewed, she, you know, she did some, I think, football, but she was doing a lot of basketball, like for the New Orleans Pelicans. And you're interviewing there, like you need to know something about the sport, right? You need to be like, oh, the challenge of today's game for you, Mr. Famous Person, you know, Anthony Davis was X. Tell me a little bit about that. And so that's where she was able to get those kind of questions for Jennifer after she'd been around at Westminster a little bit. And she kind of knew a little bit about Dog Agility. And so hopefully uh, Tony Collins uh, certainly will get there. You know, one thing I would like to add is uh, Tony Collins or whoever the, the reporter on the ground is. Maybe doing a quick interview with the judge. I was just thinking that. Right? I was literally just thinking that. I was they literally should do that thinking for about too. they should have talked to the this, judge. This the is not about role. Tim. No, it's not about our love for Tim and his course design and bringing him on the podcast. This is about. Uh, I think it would enhance the uh, the broadcast. Right. I mean, write that down. I mean, like you know, the football stadium doesn't change from game to game, right? But the judge is an integral part of the experience here. You know, putting that together. So I guess it would be a. I, I kind of like. I, I guess it's a little bit like talking to a coach, right. but it's just different. But the other thing I was going to say is like uh, the benefit of experience, like listening to Jennifer talk. And she's like, well, the first time I was on network TV, blah, blah, blah. Right. But now <laughs> I've been on network TV so many times that I, I, I put some conscious effort into how I appeared. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And it speaks to it speaks to your illustrious career in yeah. agility. Uh, Tim, how do you think judges would uh, take that? being interviewed, having to do a little like 30 second bit. Okay. The, the irony is um, judges, we, we take photos and we do that all the time, but we're always worried about looking stupid. So actually in right. the era of COVID wearing a mask, we don't worry about it. Cause I don't have to worry if my smile is stupid or if I'm not smiling or any <laughs> of that stuff. Um, I did feel for, you know, Jen and the guys that, that just finished, you know, they're the last run that the, the t- they're, you know, the, the top seeded team, they finish and into a T almost every one of them looked at me like, you want me to do what now? Do a victory lap? <laughs> no, <Nah>, I'm good. <laughs> right. They go, no, nah, I got to do this. But they almost all look like, yeah, give me a second and then I'll do my victory. Well, lap. it's kind of funny. Like, who are you doing it for? Because exactly. I think they cut it out of all of the broadcast yeah. and there's no spectators at the event. So there's really no, you know, need. I suppose if you, you could. Elect. I, I think it's tradition. You know, it is just tradition. That, tradition. But there, there was actually a lot of people that were in the upper things. I mean, nobody was congregating, but there was still a lot of people more than like at the invitational where you were all on the first floor, there was no second floor. You couldn't uh, get around. Yeah. So there was a lot more people around watching than you did it at, say, you know, the Invitational, where I don't know what the setup is at West. Right. Coast. Yeah, it's the benefit of having made the finals that you get to stay and watch, and all the workers and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, I, I'll definitely put that down. You know, I'm going to be doing kind of the wrap up article a wrap-up article for AKC Nationals, including a list of what I feel like, you know, maybe things they can consider for the following year. And hopefully all, all the right people will read that. Okay, so I'm going to get now to the booth very quickly because I think there's one thing that we do need to address. And that's um, Carolyn Mano apparently made some comments about uh, preferred dogs. So, you know, for from her point of view, she doesn't know anything about the sport. So I, I'm not I'm not blaming her. And the, and the comments I think that she made were along the lines of um, 
the because remember they did the stream so this never made it to espn2 so those of you who only watch the espn2 have no idea what we're talking about because you just saw the regular finals but remember they also streamed the challenger round right and then the uh the preferred national championship and so they brought her on and her and terry were doing commentary for the preferred national final on the live stream right so that never made it to tv or espn2 but they were there and so something to the effect of that. You're not um, going to see the precision that you're going to see in, in the, with regular the regular class, class right. you know, but basically the, the heavy implication there being the preferred dogs are not quite as good. They're a cut below, obviously people who uh, not just people who ran it, but I think a lot of people were uh, deeply offended by this. Um, and so uh, from my perspective, having also done commentary for the live stream for Four Legged Flicks uh, with various people over the last several years uh, until this whole AKC TV uh, took over. Um, she's getting a lot of the information as a newcomer to the sport, right? So she's never run a dog, right? She'd probably never been to an agility trial. And so she's getting a lot of the information from Terry, from AKC, from listening to comments and things like that. So really, I don't blame her so much. I think when we look at this, rather than saying, uh, you know, she said this horrible, mean thing and she should never come back again, is that we, we being, I guess, agility, the agility community, or more specifically AKC, needs to have in place, if they're going to do this next year, where, where her and Terry are going to be doing the preferred stream, they need to have in place, like, an explanation of preferred, maybe a graphic that they can throw up there just for the live stream. Obviously they don't need it for the, uh, the televised ESPN two stuff, but just an explanation of preferred, like how you got there, what kind of dogs are running in there and basically giving them the same billing, right? We understand that you're only allotted two hours and, um, you can't fit both regular and preferred in there. You know, it makes sense to do regular. I think a lot of people can live with that, but, those are the kind of uh, uh, comments where I think they're very innocent on her part. Like she doesn't really understand. And so, you know, she's just kind of parroting what's being said around her or even not even parroting. Like, we don't know that they said that, but just making the logical conclusion. Well, uh, you know, right? just now while you were talking, I decided to see what AKC does say about preferred. And, you know, this could be this could be the research that she did because this is on the AKC site. And it specifically says AKC preferred agility allows dogs to jump one height lower than the regular jump height division. And it gives them five extra seconds to complete the course. The program is great for seniors or dogs who have suffered injuries. This is from and the I AKC. Think that's what and, she said, right? Or that's what somebody said. At well, some point I've, on the screen. I've heard uh, a lot of criticism of, of, uh, of people who are upset about how preferred is um, presented saying I'm, you know, I'm tired of it being um, presented as something for old or, or rehabbing dogs. And it, that's not all of the dogs, but you can see that that is what AKC themselves is um, presenting this as an option. This is, it is uh, the conclusion here is this is kind of the driving force behind offering it. So I guess our point is just like, let, let's take a step back and, and uh, I guess give a little, um, grace, grace to, to the announcers for, because remember again, they can't well, go least, into the nuance, right. They right. can't go into the nuance of all the different reasons that people go into preferred. Of course, they are going to be making these generalizations well, spend like 10 seconds, you know, saying a long run on sentence of all, all the different kinds of dogs to get in there. For me, the, the big change was the year we went to Westminster with Rudy, Rudy, the um, Bull, bulldog, Rudy, the phenomenal bulldog. Right. And so they jump preferred as their, as their natural height. And, and when I heard it, then it made a lot of sense, you know, because I, I ran a Rottweiler back in the day and they have to jump 24 inches are so huge, but what would it have been like if I could have run her 20 inches over the entire course of her career? Like it preferred, could she have run like, I don't know, an extra year or two, you know, could I, could there have been less injury or, or pounding or something like that? Like there's lots of, lots of good reasons. Um, and to do it, I think I would just like to see the AKC kind of take this head on and address it um, uh, directly. But as far as Carolyn, Carolyn Mano, the the announcer, I don't I, I guess I'm not as angry at her specifically. Like, I understand the comment. It's not great. And I and I don't like that. Uh, but I'm not out there saying she shouldn't come back because actually 
I think she did a really good job. If yeah. you listen to what she was saying, she was very on top of it about who the current the winning, leader was. Right, the winning time, the time to beat who the current hot seat person and, is. And she had her sheets and she, they would be very smooth. It would, it would be as if she knew the dog, she would be like, and so-and-so has been doing agility for six years and they're from, you know, Tennessee and all, all this stuff. Right. She was very smooth. She was very good. Better, I would say, than Terry's counterpart before this last year. Now, remember at Westminster, the most recent year, they added someone new. And it's because the person who was there before and had been there, he was he was a man. And I, honestly, I, I forget his name. I'm not being spiteful. I just literally forgot his name. He did a really poor job. Like there was no improvement from year to year. He would say insulting things. He would make jokes. And then he went out there and did an interview where he basically admitted that he did no prep work, that he had has Terry do everything. And he just didn't view it seriously as a sport. Right. And like, uh, for me, like that was the final straw. I was like, you know, I can be very supportive of the telecast, the broadcast and, and Terry and everybody else. And the job Jennifer Hale is doing the improvement they show. You know, I remember Jennifer Hale that first year was like, Oh, this is the apparatus yeah. and people lost their mind. Right. Agility people are like, what is an apparatus? It's equipment. It's dog agility equipment. What are you talking about? The apparatus? This is not gymnastics. Right. And, but she learned, right? right. She learned what a dog walk was and what we pulls are and not calling them sticks in the ground and things like that. And so that's the kind of improvement I think people are looking for. So from that perspective, my view is that Carolyn did a really good job during the actual broadcast. Well, and I, I personally would like to uh, uh, see people, you know, maybe forgive her for that ignorance on her part. And, and, you know, I would lay it a little bit at the feet of the AKC here. Yeah. I I agree with that on the live stream a little bit. I think it also occurred to me just now that they knew going in that um, they were not, they were not going to have the preferred finals on TV, right? They're only doing it for the live stream. And let's be honest, how many people are watching the live stream that aren't agility? So from my perspective, I bet that whole preferred finals is essentially practice. Right. For the uh, regular finals, which is then going to be broadcast on TV. Right. So it's it's working out all of their kinks, working out their camera angles Mm -hmm. and and, uh, what they're going to say and how the course is going to run. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Totally agree with all of that. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens uh, next year. One other thing I want to point out related to the issues about the preferred dogs is the the fact that not only were the preferred finals not broadcast, but even dogs who were in the regular final, like they qualified their way in, had their runs excluded from the ESPN2 broadcast. That's the repeat broadcast, not the original live stream. Right. The live stream is live. The live is live. Every, Every run is seen and you can see it on streaming on the ESPN app. But an, an app that some people had problems getting with. In fact, I don't think even we got it free, right? We had already yeah, we paid like we already paid for that. So yeah, we paid paid so something to yeah, upgrade it. Yeah, but um, hopefully they'll work that out for next year. But on the ESPN two, like the polished, more polished broadcast, they excluded ten different dogs. And, and this is Sarah, something tell us how they did that. Yeah, this is something that we knew might happen because it has happened in broadcast before. So, you know, I was prepared enough to have printed out the running order <laughs> so that I could check off dogs if they as they run and see if they left off any dogs. And um the one thing that I will say about how they did it, uh, especially because I I know in some past broadcasts there were dogs, there was like one broadcast where like only one dog was caught cut, and I'm like, come on, you can fit in one extra dog, right? But the one thing that I'll say about how they did it is it was strictly based on finishing order, so they they um, cut out the the bottom, you know, one, two, or three dogs. Um, from the height classes. Now they didn't cut out any 24s because it was such a small class, six, six dogs, dogs. And they didn't cut out any 24 C's, such a small class. Also, six, also dogs. six dogs. So they didn't cut out any of those dogs, but it was strictly based on results. So that part, I think if you're going to uh, remove some dogs, then that is a good way to do it. Now, You made a fantastic point to me about why that might not necessarily be true because some of the top seeded dogs ended up uh, at the bottom because they, you know, they're pushing for speed. They make a mistake. They end up with an off course and they ended up being What really stood out to me, let's talk about it very quickly, is the 20 inch class. So the runs are reverse seeded. 
right? The finals runs. So it generally you're getting faster as you get toward the, the end dogs. And I think um, that's one spot I feel like Terry could have done a better job explaining how we got to the finals, how many dogs entered the event, you know, that we're taking a certain percentage into the final. These are the, the best of the dogs from the weekend. And even within the finals, like we're moving toward the dogs getting a little bit faster and building some suspense around who's going to win. But in the 20 inch class, the second and third seated dogs, right? Both had uh, like a lot of errors. And they end up getting chopped out because they just cut out the bottom dogs. But it doesn't make sense in in the uh, the, in the story, broadcast the in, the, in the story arc because yeah, because the dogs who could challenge to win were getting eliminated, right? That's and then part they of the just, drama. That's part of the suspense, right? And they just excluded their runs entirely. So you go from like a clean run that's uh, you know one speed to a clean run that's a couple of seconds faster and that's how you get your winner right and, and so, this is obviously on espn like this is not like you know terry right. wasn't running around here deciding which dogs are going to be on right. tv or not so right. that completely convinced me that you're right you can't just um you can't just lop off the bottom dogs if you're i mean personally obviously i would rather see all the dogs there but so now my my compromise would be the top five seated dogs are protected from being cut and then you take the bottom couple if you have to cut anybody Personally, I would love it if they just uh, made it, you know, a two and a half hour broadcast or remove some of the commercials. I think everybody knowing in advance, at least for this first year, like I think there are people who didn't know they fully oh, expected absolutely. to be on TV. They were already on the live stream and, you know, they got friends and family watching and then nothing. Right. Right. So that's disappointing. Whereas if you know in advance, you can be like, hey, guys, you know, of course, we're on the live stream. But, you know, we had a really poor run. So we're not going to be on the final broadcast. You know, I think if people knew in advance, it would be helpful. I agree. Tim, did you notice the photos that they oh, were using? Yes. So you tell us a little bit about that. Talking about the, the, um, the history of agility. Yes, that was um, quite enjoyable. I don't know. I, I actually wondered whether they got the permission of the people that were involved since one of the pictures had Ken Totch, the owner of USDAA. <laughs> Right. Doing and USDA, for people who don't know, clinic. USDA is like the rival or not rival, but they're the other major agility organization yeah. here in the United States. And so it's always like USDA versus AKC. And here they are using this like USDA photo, right? Well, they also included like the results from USDA. So when they talked about like how accomplished dogs were, they would show their AKC, you know, finals appearances or wins. And then it would say like other notable events and it would be like Sinosport. No, it would know? be like, it said, I think well, it literally said non-AKC. AKC, yeah. Yeah. You know, because um, I know they did that. Uh, it stood out for me on um, um, Betsy Lynch with Lark because that's could, exactly what I was thinking. That was the one I remember distinctly. But yeah, it was then. And then some of the other standard photos were some people that I've known from back in the day. And I go, that's before AKC was even formed. But oh. yeah, I mean, I guess that's a great point too. If you really want to go all the way back, it's not going to be AKC. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was at Crufts originally, and that's right. where it all started. So, yeah. right, right. I think they had that in the broadcast too, right? Where they yes, talked they about, did, yeah, did. right. Yeah. So, I always think that's uh, pretty interesting. All right. Now, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, right at the very end, we are going to go over the uh, winners for both preferred and the regular classes. Before we get there, Jen, tell us a little bit about this thing that they just do in the broadcast right at the end. They just slipped it in there, and people were like, what? What is this? It is the Premier Cup. I don't know if people noticed or if you were around for the end of the uh, end of the broadcast on ESPN2. Jen, tell us a little bit about the Premier Cup. So the Premier Cup was an event that AKC did first in 2019. Um, they were supposed to have it in 2020, but um, COVID changed that. And I did not know much about it for this year. I had heard rumor that it was going to be on the Thursday preceding World Team Tryouts in St. Louis. Um, that's what I had heard. And I think it was published somewhere. And then when tryouts were postponed, I kind of thought, well, they're just getting rid of it. And we go up to the awards table and there's this envelope, right? And it says open immediately. So I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll open immediately. <laughs> and it is an invite to the Premier Cup, which was a super fun event when I went to it in 2019. So I was very excited. And they handed me two and I said, does, does this for Swift? And they, because he got third and they said, yep top four. So from my understanding, uh, the top four placements of preferred and regular, I thought initially it was just the preferred winners, but I was corrected that top four placements and preferred top four placements and regular all received invites to the premier cup. And all it said was save the date, May 15th, Ocala, Florida. 
Um, and that's all we know. I know nothing more. I've received no additional information. Uh, there's been a question of will more invites go out? I do not know at this time that we're recording this. I know nothing more. Um, given that they're holding it at the World Equestrian Center, my guess is that it is going to be tied in with some horse event, which is how it was held in 2019. It was like the evening dog showcase after uh, in between horse events. Uh, and that was when uh, we had some filming from ESPN there as well. So I do not know much more than that, but I will be uh, very excited. I'm going to go ahead and take both dogs or my plan at this point is to take both dogs to see how it works this year. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. And so that'll be the premier cup. We'll see how that uh, shakes out. I think COVID kind of interrupted their, their arc there for the, uh, the premier cup. So we'll see what happens uh, this year. So Tim, where can people who are interested in getting more of your course maps find them? Do you share course maps on social media, on Facebook? Um, I personally don't share them, but they're all out there. But if anybody actually wants them, they can, they can find me on Facebook or they can find me in any of the judges list and I'll gladly share any course maps from um, way back when. But actually, I was just thinking one thing I wanted to ask Jen before we get off is, what did you think of the footing on the, mm. the surface there? Because, you know, I was thinking specifically on this. This was a great course for, you know, 100 dogs on dirt because it wasn't going to dry out. Would I have wanted to do it as, you know, like the, the round two standard or, you know, and have, you know, 320 inch dogs running on this course? No, I don't think so. Cause I think it would have gotten pretty torn up by the time we got to the end, but I wanted to get Jen's opinion on that. I had no complaints on surface all weekend long. Uh, the preliminary rounds, the finals, I never had an issue with myself. I never felt stuck. I never slid. Um, I never had a dog had a mistake that I was uh, thought was pertaining to surface, you know, where they were like digging out of dirt and hit a bar or slipped um, and I really didn't hear much talk about it at all. You know, I mean, I know we weren't in the stalls and the, the congregations weren't like past years, but, you know, you hear things, right? Like the broadcasting, people commenting on the broadcasting or making comments. And I never really heard anything about the surface. So I was thrilled with it. I would happily come back to Tulsa at the same facility and show again, assuming they can kind of have the, the dirt prepped in the same way. So no complaints on my end. Okay. That's, that's what was my opinion, but you know, standing in the middle of the ring, it's always different than what the competitors are actually seeing. Right. So. I feel like AKC is known for having fantastic dirt at national events. Like they've got that part down. Well, yeah. In recent years, I mean, they've had, you know, two decades to really perfect it. So <laughs> I think it's actually come quite a, a long way, right. You know, how we treat uh, surfaces. And so, yeah, pretty good. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Before we go, we're going to go um, through the winners of preferred and uh, regular class for the finals here. These are our new preferred national agility champions. We'll start there. In the four inch class, we have Chris Sanks with Nitro. In the eight inch class, Abigail Beasley with Dreamer. In the 12 inch class, Amanda Edstrom with Jive. In the 16 inch class, Paula Renee Simpson with Graphite. And in the 20-inch class, Haley Mack with Strider. So congratulations to all those dogs and handlers on their new Preferred Agility Champion title. And then on the regular side, in the 8-inch regular class, we have Betsy Lynch with Lark. In the 12-inch class, Beth Matthews Bradshaw with Pre. In the 16-inch class, of course, Jennifer Crank with Pink. Yay, congratulations, Jennifer. In the 20-inch class, we have uh, Jessica Aju with Hallelujah. In the 24-inch class, we have Amber McCune with Kaboom. And in the 24C class, we have Soshana Das with Knack. Congratulations to all our new Preferred Agility Champions and National Agility Champions. And thank you once again for joining us. Well, of course, Jennifer is always here as co-host, but thank you for joining us, Tim. My pleasure. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training. <laughs>